Five Nights at Freddy's has become such an ingrained part of the internet for so long that most people are just kind of used to it. This year had the 10th anniversary of the first game, and in that decade there have been plenty of official games, an endless number of fan games, some of which are even being remade into official games with console releases, so much fan art and fan creations, a whole ass movie made by Hollywood with well-known actors, and loads of content creators who got started just by talking about this series. It's a franchise that has made an undeniable impact on the internet. And I'd never played any of them before this summer. I knew about the series, I heard the name Five Nights at Freddy's here and there on the internet from basically the beginning, and I had a general idea of what these games were, but only about a year ago did I develop any sort of interest in them. Recently I got a Windows laptop after using a Chromebook for a while, and that meant I had the chance to play these games as they were originally intended. No mobile ports, no console releases, on the computer with a mouse. Out of mostly curiosity, but also one other reason that will be obvious later, I wanted to dive into the series and really get a feel for it, because playing a game and watching someone else play a game are very different experiences. I played the first six Five Nights at Freddy's games and wanted to do a retrospective on this chapter of the series at large. This will be divided into three parts. The first two parts will be reviewing the series, analyzing the gameplay, art direction, horror, and stories of each individual game. The second part will be a comprehensive lore breakdown. Yes, hardly a revolutionary idea. I got interested in these games in the first place due to a Wendigoon video doing exactly that. Still, it's my channel. I can throw my hat in the ring if I want to. But before all that, let's go back to the very beginning, when it all started in August 2014 with the original Five Nights at Freddy's. This game absolutely popped off on the internet, and while there's rarely ever one reason these things happen, I can guess that a part of it was this game pioneering the mascot horror subgenre. If it wasn't the actual first, it was the first with a big impact. For those who don't know, Mascot Horror is a specific kind of indie horror game that takes characters made for kids and turns them into something horrifying. Due to its duality of kid-friendly and mature content, it has a big market, as Five Nights at Freddy's has demonstrated. Nowadays, the subgenre is oversaturated and there's way too much of it, but back in 2014, it was a novel idea. The premise of Five Nights at Freddy's is very simple. You are a nighttime security guard starting your new job at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a local restaurant chain that features animatronics to entertain the kids. During the day, these machines do exactly what they're supposed to do, but at night, they roam freely. And unfortunately for you, they really want to enter your office and murder you. You are given a few tools to use, you can watch them on security cameras, you can check the hallways next to your office with a light, and you can remotely close the doors. The issue is that all of those things drain power, and your power is limited. Yes, even the doors closing drains power. This is such a nitpick, but quick little tangent, as someone who is currently in school to get a master's degree in engineering, this just kind of bugs me. I suppose if you gave me enough time, I could imagine some ridiculous design for an automatic door that drains power by sliding downwards. But why this would be implemented when a regular door with a lock would be cheaper, easier to install, and more effective is beyond me. This pushes my suspension of disbelief way more than the murderous animatronics. Tangent aside, yes, the doors drain power, and power is a precious resource. You don't have much to spare, and you need to make it last your whole midnight to 6am shift. Going into this, I assumed you didn't want to run out of power because then you couldn't use the doors, but it's actually a lot more direct than that. If the power goes out, Freddy Fazbear will come into your office, play a little song, and kill you himself. The two most important objectives in this game are not to let an animatronic into your office and don't run out of power. When it's laid out like this, it seems very simple, and to an extent it is, but there are a lot of little things and nuances you need to understand if you want to survive all five nights. The first thing you need to know is that the cameras are not nearly as useful as you might think. Most of your time and power will be spent dealing with two animatronics, Bonnie the Bunny and Chica the Chicken. These two were the ones who killed me a vast majority of the time. They both have the same strategy of gradually walking up to an office door before entering, and while it is tempting to track their progress through the cameras, that uses up way too much power to be practical. 
Instead, it's better to take advantage of the fact that every time they move, whether it's going to a different room or walking up to the office door, you can hear footsteps. Whenever you hear the sound, you can check both hallway lights. If one is there, you can close the door after being jump scared. Then you use the lights every few seconds to see if they left so you can open the door again. Bonnie and Chica can and should be dealt with not using the cameras at all because there's no reason to, it just drains power. That is not the case with the other two animatronics, Freddy and Foxy. They both have generally the same strategy of making their way over in stages, but unlike Bonnie and Chica, they are slowed down every time the cameras are on. They don't even need to be watched, the cameras are used and they're slowed down, even if it's just a quick glance. Freddy is the sneakiest of the four threats, he's the only one who actively hides on the cameras. But Foxy is a little less subtle. He'll gradually peek out from behind a curtain before making a mad dash to your office, in which case you need to drop everything and slam the door in his face. It is worth mentioning that there is a fifth animatronic, but it's more of an easter egg than a gameplay mechanic. Very rarely you'll see what looks like a yellow version of Freddy, nicknamed Golden Freddy by the fanbase, and you need to look away immediately or else you'll die. I did see it happen like once or twice, but overall this one is pretty much a non-factor. The strategy I used was alternating between listening for Bonnie and Chica with quick glances at the cameras every so often to slow down Freddy and Foxy. This method was what allowed me to finally beat Night 5, which is the only night I had any trouble with. This game's skill curve felt more like a skill wall. I was able to make it through the first four nights without really having a plan, but it took dozens of attempts to beat the final night. During those many, many attempts, I realized two things. Firstly, your real enemy is not the bloodthirsty robots, it's the power. I had to go through the arc of first using too much power and running out, to then overcompensating and limiting my power use to the point that animatronics got in my office, to finally finding a good balance and eventually winning the game. The second realization was that one of the biggest draws of this franchise is also kind of a double-edged sword. The threats in all these games move based on RNG. There's a set time interval where a random number between 1 and 20 is chosen, and each animatronic has their own number between 1 and 20. If the rolled number is lower than theirs, they move, and a threat's number can fluctuate during a night. This allows for the general level of activity to be set while still being different on every attempt. This is a good thing, this means these games have tons of replay value. But on the other hand, you can't just get unlucky. Most of the power is used dealing with Bonnie and Chica, especially when they just camp in front of a closed door draining away power you can't afford to lose. The bare minimum amount of power necessary in order to not die varies a lot. So that means your margin of error everywhere else is for the most part at the whims of a random number generator. This makes winning a little less satisfying than it could have been. When I finally made it to 6am on night 5, it felt less like I had mastered the mechanics and more like RNG Jesus had just blessed me that time. I do have a few problems, but overall I think Five Nights at Freddy's has decent gameplay. It was a good gameplay loop, engaging enough to make me want to see things through, even if it was stressful and frustrating at times. Still, Five Nights at Freddy's would not have become the cultural phenomenon it was if it just had good gameplay. Another thing it does well is the horror. This series has become notorious for jump scares, and that is a reputation it absolutely earned, but the first game also has some great atmosphere. I love the sound design, everything sounds great, from musical stings, to sounds that help you with gameplay, to noises that have no purpose besides distracting you and contributing to the atmosphere. And you get plenty of time to soak in that atmosphere while you're playing. It's during these moments of relative quiet that the stress and fear of this game really hit me. Another thing this game did well was its character design. One thing Five Nights at Freddy's did that a lot of other mascot horror games didn't was making the character designs that work both as children's characters and as horror villains. When I see these animatronics in promo pictures or in regular lighting, they look totally normal. But on the cameras, with the dramatic lighting and angles, they look so much more sinister. Though that does bring to mind one other problem. Some of the best images in this game are the animatronics on the cameras, but since you're not going to be looking at any camera feed for long, this means some of the best content in terms of horror is put in a place you're probably not going to look. 
this kind of just feels like a wasted opportunity. I didn't love Five Nights at Freddy's, but there is a lot to like here. It has engaging gameplay, good art direction, and a horror that goes well beyond cheap jump scares. It feels like a simple one and done kind of game, and the series creator Scott Cawthon intended for it to be exactly that, a one-off. However, when this game blew up on the internet, I can see why he made a sequel. In November 2014, only a few months after the first game, Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was published on Steam. The design philosophy for Five Nights at Freddy's 2 seemed to be, hey, remember this thing you liked from the first game? Here it is again, but more so. This game, we got more animatronics, more cameras, more lore, more gameplay mechanics. However, more doesn't necessarily mean better, and I do have some problems with the gameplay of Five Nights at Freddy's 2. The setup is the same as the first game, except this is clearly a different location. The most immediate difference is that there are no doors in this office. You have an open vent on each side and an open hallway in front of you, each equipped with a little light. Animatronics can and will come by, so when they do, your last line of defense is a Freddy Fazbear mask. Luckily for you, these animatronics are stupid and have no object permanence, because even if you put the mask on right in front of them, they'll just leave you alone. If an animatronic shows up in your vents, you have a few seconds to react and put the mask on, but sometimes they can just teleport in front of you, suddenly appearing the next time you flip the screen down, or even pushing it down themselves. When this happens, your reaction window goes from a few seconds to maybe half of one second. This is by far what I struggled with the most in this game. Two animatronics are not fooled by the mask. The first is Foxy, who always appears in the front hallway. When you see him, you need to flash him with the hall light a few times to make him leave. The problem is that unlike the vent lights or any of the lights on the cameras, this one light you need to use to survive has limited battery. It's not nearly as strict as the power system in the first game, I only ever ran out of battery once, but it's still something to keep track of. Foxy's mechanic is further augmented by one of the new animatronics named Balloon Boy. He is the only one that doesn't kill you if he gets in the office. Instead, he disables your hall light, putting you at Foxy's mercy, which he has none of. So he doesn't kill you directly, but unless the night is almost over, letting Balloon Boy slip past you is a death sentence. Aside from Foxy, the other animatronic not fooled by the mask is a new one, the puppet. On one of the cameras labeled Prize Corner, the puppet is contained in a box, and if he gets out, it's over. It's like when the power goes out in the first game, all you can do is hope the night ends before you're killed. The only thing keeping the puppet at bay is the sound of a music box. The problem is that the song only lasts a few seconds, so you need to remotely wind it up on its camera feed. This is something you have to do roughly a hundred times a night. This music box is the most controversial mechanic in the game, if not the whole series, and I understand why. It's not difficult, it's just tedious. It's busy work that takes a lot of time throughout the night. These three mechanics you're constantly juggling, the mask, the hall light, and the music box, work together to make Five Nights at Freddy's 2 very chaotic and stressful. These three things are mutually exclusive. When you're using one, you can't use the other two, and they each have their own little quirks. The music box is not difficult to deal with. In all my runs, I only let the puppet escape one time. Instead, it serves more as a time-consuming distraction, pulling your attention away from other things you should be doing. Foxy appearing in the hallway has the opposite problem. It happens infrequently enough that I was actually able to forget about it a couple times. And if you forget about Foxy, you're in for one of the worst jump scares this series has to offer. <laughs> Lastly, we got the mask mechanic. The animatronics from the vents are easy to deal with, but the ones appearing right in front of you were the bane of my existence while playing this game. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 expects lightning fast reflexes. If you're jump scared, the fraction of a second it takes for you to recover from being caught off guard will likely lead to your death. If you hesitate even slightly, you're probably going to die. Most of my deaths were because I couldn't put the mask on in time. In order to win, you need to be on red alert constantly, or even prematurely lowering the mask every time you flip down the camera just in case. This was something I had to learn gradually through trial and error, and by the end of it, I was locked in, seething and wanting to win almost out of spite. I'm still by no means an expert, and I won by the skin of my teeth. 
On my successful night four attempt, I accidentally let Balloon Boy in because I took off the mask too soon because the music box was about to run out. I pretty much accepted defeat, but the night was almost over, so I kept playing just in case. Later, I heard the jump scare noise and saw Foxy begin his leap, but mid-pounce, the shift ended. If this had happened even a fraction of a second earlier, I would have lost. Thankfully, this has happened to other people who are recording their gameplay, so I can show you what it looked like. I'm just gonna do this and see how long it lasts. <laughs> My winning night 5 run wasn't much better. That was the time I ran out of flashlight battery. I was so sure Foxy was going to get me, but I was able to slip by. Barely. The gameplay in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is more flawed and much more annoying than the first game, but at the same time, victory was a lot more satisfying because it really felt like I earned it. It's just a lot, and not only makes it harder than the first game, but in my opinion, this is the hardest of any of these games I've played. The difficulty curve is way worse this time around. It started getting about as hard as Night 5 from the first game on Night 3. None of these games gave me as much trouble as Five Nights at Freddy's 2. But aside from the new gameplay, this sequel boasts a big cast of animatronics, one of the biggest in the series. Aside from all the same animatronics from the first game, though you've probably noticed they all look a little worse for wear, there are more cutesy, kid-friendly versions of the four main characters. None of them are particularly aggressive, and they're not scary at all aside from the toy version of Foxy, which is named Mangle. There are only two wholly new animatronics introduced in this game, Balloon Boy and the Puppet. Balloon Boy sucks. He's ugly and stupid and annoying and I hate him, as does everybody else. The puppet has a very interesting character design. Not scary as much as eerie. You don't see much of him during the main game, but you do get snippets here and there that indicate he has a much bigger role to play here. The real stars of the show are the returning animatronics from the first game, all broken down, withered versions of themselves. These designs all look great, Bonnie and Chica especially. Time has not been kind to them and they are going to take it out on you. Just like the last time, most of my deaths were because of Bonnie and Chica. The story is better in this game than it was in the first one. The premise is the same, but you also get the impression that something bigger is happening in the background. Aside from the daily phone calls, which do more world building than before, after you die a few times, you sometimes play these little Atari style games that give you some lore, so I'll be discussing that more in part 3. As for horror, this game isn't scary as much as it is stressful. The first game had spooky atmosphere that you had room to appreciate, but in 2, once pressure starts getting applied, it doesn't stop until 6am. It is a constant chaos and you don't get a moment to breathe on later nights. It's overwhelming and is just as likely to induce rage as it is fear. One thing a sequel should do is improve on problems that the first game had, and this game is a mixed bag in that regard. The most annoying thing in one was Bonnie and Chica camping in front of the doors, and this game has a counterpart to that. Foxy camping in the hallway. Nobody seems to know how many flashes of the hall light it takes to make Foxy go away. Probably because even if you do it right, he doesn't immediately leave. He just stands there, encouraging you to second guess yourself and waste battery flashing him more times. Thankfully, the power management is much more forgiving than it was in the first game. As long as you use the light sparingly, you should be fine. That RNG hell I talked about in the first game is still present here. You can't just have one thing after another thrown at you, but this game was already too much too fast, so it doesn't really have as much of an impact. Lastly, remember how I said the cameras were kind of a missed opportunity in one? With the music box, that problem is way worse in two. I don't even know what most of the rooms in this place look like. I never had the opportunity to check. There was always something else I had to be doing. If the cameras were underutilized in the first game, they're all but pointless here. The only camera I ever looked at was camera 11, and that's because that's the one with the music box. 
In conclusion, while I do think Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is a step down from the first game, it's not a big step, and a lot of it is based on preference. This game seems to be pretty divisive in general, with plenty of fans calling it the best in the series and plenty of other fans calling it the worst. But no matter where you stand on that matter, if you really wanted something different, you weren't getting it from this game. You're more likely to get that from Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Just in premise alone, this game is a little different from the first two. You're not even at a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. You're at Fazbear's Fright, a sort of pop-up, walk-through, haunted location attraction all about the restaurant chain and the local legend it had become since it closed, which at this point in the timeline was years ago. You're a worker whose job it is to just watch the patrons on the cameras, scare them with remote audio clips, and keep track of the ventilation system. The first night is totally normal, with nothing dangerous happening. But on night two, your coworker tells you about some great finds at an abandoned location. Real authentic training tapes, and more relevant to you, a genuine Fazbear Entertainment animatronic, which they brought back to put on display. These characters don't know how bad of an idea this is, but we as the audience sure do. The good news is that this one rabbit is the only animatronic trying to kill you in the third game. The bad news is that he is an exponentially bigger threat than any we'd seen in the series before. This animatronic, the face of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, is never named in the game itself, but since then has gotten the nickname Springtrap, and he is more than capable of keeping your hands full all on his own. So far in the series, the animatronics have had a cyclical pattern. They approach, you get rid of them, they try again. Springtrap is more like a souped up version of Freddy from the first game. He'll approach your office in a set path, sometimes climbing into the vents to get there faster. But you can't reset this path, you can only slow his progress or push him back a little. One consequence of this not being a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is that there isn't equipment set up to deal with roaming animatronics. All you can do is lure him into an adjacent room with an audio cue and block his path when he climbs into the vents. That's it. You don't have doors. You don't even have a mask. If Springtrap gets into your office, you already lost. Even so, if that was all you had to deal with, this game would be a cakewalk. Unfortunately, there are some other things getting in your way. The systems you're using are apparently made out of duct tape and broken dreams because they fail at the drop of a hat. If you want to use them again, and you'll have to, you need to do a lengthy reboot process that requires looking away from the main monitor you're using for several seconds. When you're done with that, Springtrap has probably moved and you need to find him on the cameras again. This is harder than it sounds because like Freddy from 1, he hides on the cameras and he is really good at it. Look at this. Springtrap is in all of these images. Besides crummy equipment, you also have to deal with the Phantom animatronics, spectral versions of characters from previous games. They all operate like Golden Freddy. If you see them, you need to look away immediately or you're going to get jump scared. They don't kill you, but they can disable your ventilation. They add this element of randomness that keeps things fresh from run to run. I also feel like I should mention that Phantom Foxy gave me what might be the worst jump scare in the entire series. There was no buildup, no warning, just... <laughs> Even though you do have a fair amount to keep track of, the difficulty is a lot more reasonable than it was in previous installments. Starting at night two, each night took me a few attempts to beat, so there's a nice difficulty curve. This was the first game where I never got nervous that I'd never be able to beat it, which did happen with the other two. I actually really like the gameplay in 3. None of the mechanics feel underused or over-centralizing, and there is a very clear design direction here. The last two games felt like tower defense systems, defending a place from an onslaught of enemies, but Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is more like a boss fight, a duel between you and one single enemy. And this is a duel that wouldn't work nearly as well as it does if Springtrap wasn't such a great adversary. Springtrap is my favorite animatronic in the series in terms of design. Part of it is the mystery. We had never seen this character before, so we don't even know what an intact version of the animatronic is supposed to look like. Our only point of reference is this broken down, decaying machine that's falling apart and looks like it smells horrible. 
Add the glowing eyes and permanent grin, and this is a great character design for a horror villain. There are some truly unsettling images of this thing on the cameras, and the gameplay of 3 sets it up so you organically see them during gameplay. The sight of Springtrap staring at you from the other side of the office window is such a chilling, cursed image. Springtrap feels more overtly malicious and evil than any of the other animatronics, especially when you look at some of the details. For example, the audio lore, the sound he'll stop his dogged pursuit of you to investigate, is the sound of a child's voice. Hello? I don't think you need me to tell you what kind of implications that has. Another thing that I didn't even notice while I was playing and looked up when I read about this later is the game over screen. In the first two games, the game over screen shows the aftermath of your death the night guard being stuffed into an animatronic suit, but this game over screen is just black. To me, that implies you're better off not seeing what happens if Springtrap gets his hands on you. From a story perspective, a lot of the horror comes from the mystery surrounding Springtrap. What character is this? Why have we never seen it before? And why was this just laying at an abandoned location for years? You do get the answers, and it's one of the craziest reveals in the series, but I'll get to that in detail in the third part with the lore. Aside from good gameplay and a good villain, I love the setting here. Fazbear's Fright is meant to be a horror attraction, so it looks scary in a way Freddy Fazbear's Pizza didn't. And this location is directly linked to the gameplay. The path Springtrap takes is so linear because this place is designed to be a walkthrough attraction. You're so under-equipped to deal with this threat because murderous animatronics were never meant to be a factor here in the first place. There's a cohesion that makes the setting feel a little bit more real. In case it wasn't obvious, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is my favorite of the original trilogy and one of my favorite games in the series. It would have made a good final entry and it was originally intended to be just that, but Scott Cawthon said he wasn't satisfied and would go on to make more games. At this point, the series really started experimenting, expanding on itself, and this began with the fourth game, but this video has gone on too long already, so I'll finish the reviews in the next part. I'll see you then.